On behalf of our team at HBK, I would like to welcome you to Understanding HHS Provider Relief Funds, Reporting Requirements and Tactical Planning, presented by Kyle Corsamel, Matthew Hendricks, and Michael Byra of our Healthcare Solutions Group. Our session is scheduled for 60 minutes and is being recorded. Please note that all attendees are set up in listen-only mode. We'll be answering questions at the end of the session. If you would like to submit a question to our panel, please use the question box in the GoToWebinar control bar. You can also download a copy of the presentation materials in the handout section of the GoToWebinar control bar. A copy of the recording and presentation will be emailed to you. Information is changing daily, and we encourage you to visit our website, hbkcpa.com forward slash COVID for the latest news and commentary. And at this time, I will turn it over to Kyle. Thank you, Lori. For anyone who is unfamiliar with HBK, we wanted to start off the presentation with a few slides surrounding HBK, a little bit of an overview. We're a financial services firm based out of four states. Our main office is in Ohio, which is currently where I'm sitting. We're in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, which is where Mike Byra is sitting, and in Florida. We have 16 offices across these states. And as I said, we are a full service accounting firm. And where if you want to move to the next slide, we have more than we have more to offer than just our typical tax and audit. We also have our wealth advisor group, retirement planning, corporate finance, risk advisory, and evaluation group as well. So this slide is just an overview of our core capabilities. If any of these have any significance to you, your practice, your facility, uh, feel free to reach out to any of the presenters and we can get you into the right segment of the HBK family. The presenters here are part of the HBK Healthcare Solutions Group. Uh, we're, a we're a team that's separated out between our different offices. We specialize in senior living, which includes nursing and assisted living facilities, as well as private and group physician practices. In addition to your tax planning, audit, and other compliance work, we offer benchmarking, benchmarking analysis, projection analysis, and cost report preparation, in addition to the typical services. The presenters here today are going to be Mike Byra. He is based out of New Jersey. Again, myself, I'm sitting in Youngstown, Ohio, and Matt Hendricks is based out of Florida. And I will pass it off now to Mike in New Jersey. Thanks, Kyle. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, so let's, I'm just going to go through a kind of an overview of the fund itself and the various phases and eligibility. Uh, for those who are eligible to receive funds from the Provider Relief Fund. So what is it? Basically what it is, it's a $175 billion fund that was created by the CARES Act. Uh, the funds were going to be released in several tranches with the stated goal of providing financial relief to providers who had unexpected expenditures and or lost revenues from COVID-19. The money is deemed to be a taxable grant that does not need to be repaid but it is subject to reporting requirements and various terms and conditions that the HHS has provided. And on the next slide, we'll talk about who is eligible to receive the funds. And these are some of these tranches that I, that I just mentioned. So in phase one, the provide, uh, providers who build Medicare fee-for-service, that was the initial $50 billion phase one funds that were available to be allocated to, to various providers. And the grant, it was, based on the proportion of Medicare fee-for-service payments during 2019, and these funds were automatically distributed to various providers. So if one day you looked at your bank account and all of a sudden there was some money there, that's what this was. 
The next phase was for providers who participated in Medicaid or CHIP programs, and also for dental providers who did not receive any funds from phase one. And this was an $18 billion allocation of the 175. There was an application that you needed to, to send in to apply for the funds, and it was due back in September. Also, they, the HHS had targeted distributions for providers that they felt were particularly impacted by COVID-19, by the outbreak. And back in May, an allocation of funds was made to providers in rural areas and also skilled nursing facilities. And in July, they allocated funds to facilities that they felt were very highly impacted um, by, the, by the outbreak. Additionally, there was an allocation made for providers who treated uninsured COVID patients. And providers are able to apply for these funds via a portal on the HHS website. And, you basically, and you're applying for reimbursement at the Medicare rate. A recent announcement from the HHS is phase three. And what that is, the, the providers that are eligible for phase three funds are the same providers from phase one and two, but now they've also extended it to include some behavioral health providers that may have been excluded in the previous phases. Additionally, if you were not in practice, in 2019, if you're a new practice in 2020, you are not eligible to receive funds from these first couple phases. Now, if you were in practice between January 1st and March 31st of 2020, you're now eligible to receive some funds from the phase three distribution. And as of yesterday, the application is now available and the deadline to apply for these funds is November 6th. And on the next slide, you're gonna see a you'll see a visual representation of the breakdown of the funds for each of the different uh, demographic of provider. Uh, the, un the unallocated number is, we can shave about 20 billion off from that because that's what was allocated to the phase three. So on the next slide, we're gonna talk about what needs to be done after you get the money. You get the money, what do you do with it now? So the HHS, they released an update on September 19th that issued additional guidance on the reporting data and the anticipated timelines that providers are gonna to have to keep to with the, with the money they receive. An attestation is required from each provider that they would use the funds as set out in the terms and conditions. And you, can, you could have um, made this attestation via the portal on the HHS website. However, if you did not return the funds that you received within 90 days, they consider that an, an affirmative attestation that you're gonna follow the terms and conditions and that you're gonna use the funds appropriately. Providers that receive payments in excess of $10,000 is going to need to submit a report to HHS. And the reporting system is going to open on January 15th, 2021. And these reports are going to be due to uh, report your 2020 expenditures by February 15th, 2021. In the event that you did not spend all of the funds that you received by the end of the year, you're going to have to submit a second report that's going to be due July 31st, 2021. So essentially, you're gonna to have to submit two reports if you didn't spend all the money that you received by the end of the year. So if you, if you didn't, you need to spend it by June 30th, 2021, and then you're gonna to have to submit a second report of, the, of what you use those funds for by July 31st, 2021. So now what are the reporting requirements? On, as I mentioned on, 9, on September 19th, they issued some data elements that are gonna be requested as part of the reporting process. And there's various types of demographic data that they're gonna be requesting in this report. And so we have them laid out here, the reporting, the reporting entity. And if the entity has subsidiary uh, taxpayer identification numbers that received phase one funds, the parent company can report on those funds. The, the subsidiary, subsidiaries are not going to have to report individually on the use of those phase one funds. However, if a subsidiary did receive targeted distribution funds, that subsidiary is going to have to report on the use of those funds individually. 
Some other information they're going to want is the tax ID number of the parent and any and all subsidiaries covered by the filing. An optional uh, data element they're going to request is the national provider identifier number if you have one. You're going to want to provide the fiscal year end date, and they're also going to want to know what type of business you are. If you're an S corp, a C corp, trust, LLC, an exempt organization, and so on. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kyle to discuss some of the more details on the expenses that you can use with the funds that you receive. Thanks, Mike. So this was the million dollar question that the September 19th guidance uh, issued. Uh, what expenses maybe may these funds be used for and what can be applied to use the funds when doing this new reporting requirement this upcoming year? Uh, this is the big question that we've been getting from a number of our clients, and it's what expenses can I apply, what can I not apply, and we're going to go into a little bit more detail about why there was a difference or what changes there are from the initial terms and agreement or terms and conditions to now. Uh, but in totality, the expense treatment and needs to be for treating confirmed or suspected cases of the coronavirus, preparing for the possible or actual cases, or maintaining healthcare delivery capacity. Um, most healthcare providers who have received these funds are maintaining healthcare capacity if you are still up running and you know doing your healthcare services, uh, a lot of these expenses are going to be included. Um, we've tried our best to vet with some of our uh, providers and internally uh, to, to give some best case scenarios or some, some questions that we've been hearing the most about. Uh, but when you're thinking about the expense treatment, always go back to it's the actual expenses incurred net of any reimbursed sources. So, for instance, they talked about HHS listed payments received from insurance. So, if there was some type of an insurance policy for to be reimbursed for some type of hazard or casualty losses, um, you know, just remember that those any of those types of reimbursements need to be applied against those actual expenses before your reporting them here. And then amounts from federal, state, and local government. That would include any PPP loans, any EIDL loans, uh, or any other federal or government grants or sources that you've come from. That's, been, that's one of our largest items that we've seen is providers trying to keep the money that they've applied for the PPP loans separate from the money that they're applying for the HHS Provider Relief Fund. More, you can move to the next slide. As HHS listed out in their guidance in mid-September, these are the three different buckets of provider reporting requirements. Any anybody who's received under the ten thousand dollar mark, there's not a formal reporting requirement. Anybody who's received between ten thousand and that five hundred thousand um, will have to report from the guidance. It looks like two numbers: general and administrative expenses, and your other healthcare-related expenses, and the totality for your reporting period. As Mike just mentioned, there's going to be different reporting timelines. One will be through the end of this year, through the calendar year, 2020. And then if there's any funds that have not been used, there will be another one that will be due at the end of July. And then the last one includes the biggest. So we're talking about anybody who's received $500,000 or more. The reporting requirements on this are substantially more detailed as you'll need to report your expenses by quarter and by subcategory 
for 2019 and 2020. Now we're going to keep in mind the 2019 numbers. A lot of this, if you're a provider who's gotten $500,000 or more, a lot of this information can start to be accumulated now in preparation for the reporting requirement, which will be due in 2021. We're now going to go a little bit into the the more detailed headers of the general administrative and the other healthcare related expenses. Now the initial terms and conditions explicitly said that general and administrative expenses would not be allowed to be reported against this. The guidance that was issued on September 19th very much contradicts this. What we know is there is going to be significant FAQs that are going to be issued between now and the end of the year for the reporting requirement, which will help vet out a little bit of the questions that some people may have. We've been on the phone with HHS, and this is some of the things we do know and some of the things we don't know. Mortgage and rent will be able to be applied for your general administrative expenses. Now, that's what we know. This includes the property taxes and property insurance premiums. What we don't know is if HHS is going to follow those same related party rent treatment as the PPP loan. For instance, there are some providers who own the building that they physically do their operations in, but have it in a separate entity. PPP loans, you were able to trace back to that initial entity if it was your own, if it was a related party, HHS hasn't issued any guidance on that. So it's something that we need to be cognizant of, and we're going to be looking for FAQs, but we're advising providers to evaluate it both on a strictly rent expense basis and on the expenses that go from the actual lessor. Insurance premiums are now going to be allowed to be applied to the HHS bonds. And that includes any of the premiums for these insurances. Now, no, any reimbursements from insurance need to be applied against these costs, as my previous slide mentioned, but the premiums paid for the policies are includable. And then the largest one that we've, we've seen is, is personnel. So we are talking about the staffing, employees. Um, there is a gap between the limits of the PPP loan, which are $100,000 of a, your salary, and HHS has explicitly said that the limit to be applied is $197,300, which is the executive pay level two. So there is a gap between what employee expenses can be used for the PPP loan and what can be used for HHS. And what we've been advising some of our clients is to delineate and be sure that if you are going to have employees that are making above that 100 up to this 197 that you are delineating which how much is going to the PPP loan how much is going to HHS and if at some point you're completed with the PPP loan what time and what pay periods you're moving to apply to the HHS funding or you can go to the next slide. Uh, fringe benefits are another another large expense that I know a lot of providers have been incurring. Hazard pay is a large a large expense for a number of providers as nursing um, or LPN, RN type costs are very you know, very very hard to staff. And hazard pay is, is becoming a, a long, a long-standing process here. In, in addition, employee health insurance is also being included. They've included lease payments and then utilities and operations. So, what we know is food preparation and supplies, in addition to logistics and transportation expenses, are included. If, for instance, you are you own a skilled nursing facility. A lot of these 
services, the food preparation, transportation, these are also expenditures that you've been incurring moving your residents from place to place. So this has opened up the floodgate for some of these expenses to be applied for this funding. And then the catch-all other general administration. So what we do know about that is that it includes legal fees and audit and accounting services. Go to the next slide. And then the healthcare related side of this. What they did at HHS was they made a blanket definition, expenses paid for blank, for the purchase of blank, and that would include supplies, equipment, so the next subheaders. But the key is used to prevent, prepare for, or respond to the coronavirus during this reporting period. So what we've done is we've starred some of the largest expenditures that we've been seeing a lot of our clientele, a lot of providers having additional expenses for. Uh, personal protective equipment is single-handedly the biggest expense or increased expense between 2019 and 2020 for providers that we've seen. Uh, whether that's additional gloves, whether that's masks for nurses, masks for um, the people in the administration, this is single-handedly the largest expenditure. In addition, hand sanitizer, uh, you can't walk anywhere without seeing hand sanitizer within you know, 15, 20 feet, it seems like. Um, supplies for patient screening, um, equipment, ventilators, uh, as many, many of you know what COVID-19 does for the body. Uh, ventilators have been in high demand. Additionally, there's expenditures, expenditures that are being spent on these. Um, so, you know, that's one of our largest. Where we can go to the next slide. Information technology, as providers are moving on to telehealth, there's additional expenditures, whether that be computers, whether that be if you're a nursing home or an assisted living facility, there's been a substantial amount of Skype or Skype-like um, purchases so that residents can interact with their families. Uh, these would all be you know, information type expenditures that were used. And then facility, permanent or temporary structures. If you're an office that you had to put additional walls up, additional um, you know, structures in order to separate patients, whether that be in a waiting room or during in an actual office structure, uh, an office structure. You know, these are all things that can be. And then again, the other is your catch-all. So any other expenditures that haven't been captured, um, as, as long as they relate directly to healthcare. Um, and what we wanted to note here was HHS has explicitly said wages, salaries, benefits can be applied for this money. So if you have continued a practice throughout this pandemic or even subsequent as we have during the pandemic, but as things are starting to begin to open up, um, these expenditures can be applied to the funding. Um, that opens up the floodgate a little bit more of what can be applied to this and makes it a little easier to meet that HHS money threshold, how much money you've received, what you can expend it on. The idea behind the funding was you first must look at your expenditures before you look at your lost revenue. Uh, again, that's more definitive guidance than what was issued earlier. Um, this is more of an expense. We believe it's more of a an auditable, a little bit more of a compliance, easier to, to substantiate. Um, invoices are easier to look at than lost revenues on a quarterly basis, but you know, we, we wanted to bring it up that expenses are first, payroll and payroll related expenses are what we suspect to be the one of the largest, 
And when you're considering all of these different expenditures, if you're over that $500,000 HHS provider relief fund mark, you need to break this out not only a year, but also by quarter in the year. And it needs to be known that it's based on a calendar year quarter. So if you are a, a fiscal year that has a non non traditional year end, an eleven thirty or a ten uh, thirty you may have a slightly different type of reporting structure than you're used to. So if if after expenditures you still don't have enough to apply for the HHS provider relief, then you have to move on to the lost revenues. And at this point, I'm going to pass it to Matt Hendricks, and he's going to go through the details of that. All right. Thank you, Kyle. I uh, appreciate you going through all those uh, expenses. And um, as Kyle said, um, the second the second piece of the HHS report, um, so you first apply um, any expenses that would qualify under all the categories Kyle just covered. Um, and then the second piece would to then be apply any remaining funds you have to this lost revenues calculation. So it is our current belief as of right now um, that if you spend all of the funds on qualifying expenses, it will not be necessary to go through this lost revenues calculation. So I say it's our belief right now because um, they're still to be released, frequently asked questions, webinars. Um, HHS hasn't definitively said yes or no one way or the other, but it's just our current belief that you won't have to go through that. Um, it's important for me to point that out because you'll see over the next couple of slides, um, it's time consuming to go through this lost revenue calculation. And if we could at all avoid going through it, um, we may want to do that. Um, so just keep that in mind as we, as we start going through this a little bit. Uh, the big change from the September 19th release by HHS was um, it's no longer a lost revenue calculation per se. It is now a lost net operating income calculation from patient care related sources. Uh, so it was our previous belief that it was going to be based on gross revenue year over year change, but that's, that's no longer the case. It is uh, net operating income, so gross revenue less um, applied expenses. Um, and as Kyle kind of briefly mentioned, you are going to have to put together quarterly reports to calculate this. So you're going to have to put together quarterly reports for 2019 and for 2020, calculating your net operating income from patient care related sources. Um, so I'll go into how we go about doing that a little bit on the next couple of slides. Um, but that right there is quite a bit extra of work that if we can at all avoid it, we, we may want to. Um, so, Lori, if you mind going to the next slide. So, this uh, this quarterly report that we're going to put together uh, for this lost revenue calculation, HHS wants us to break out um, revenue by source. Uh, so, you're going to show your gross revenue, and of that total gross revenue, they want a breakdown of all the different sources of revenue that you have in the total uh, that got you to that full number. So, you, they're going to want a breakout of Medicare Part A, Part B. Medicaid, commercial insurance, self-pay, and the big one to note here is this last piece, uh, other assistance received. So for 2020 purposes, the SBA and PPP money, also any local, state grants, tribal assistance, or business insurance that you received would be considered income for purposes of the lost revenue calculation. Um, so, I mean, putting together this information sometimes may be easier for some providers than others. Um, sometimes our, you know, QuickBooks, uh, maybe it doesn't break it out that far, so we may need to use additional reports to further break down the income. So, I mean, the information might be there. It might just be a pain to get it all broken down and put together. So, it's going to cause somebody to expend quite a bit of time there. Also, what I've noticed with a few of my clients um, when we're kind of going through this calculation for them, if we throw SBA and PPP money into um, gross revenue calculation and we compare 2019 to 2020, you may be in a position where they're actually better off in 2020 than they were in 2019. So that makes the whole lost revenue calculation almost a moot point. Um, 
and also some of the providers we've we've worked with they've been really successful in kind of cutting their costs and running kind of lean but i mean that kind of hurts them in terms of the lost net operating income calculation on a year-over-year -year basis so just some of those things to keep in mind uh next slide please lori so we have the revenue piece of our quarterly reports for 2019 and 2020 now um, you also have to layer in the expenses to get to your net operating income calculation for those two years before you do the, the breakdown between the two and figure out what the lost revenue piece was. Um, so the expenses here are going to be very similar to what Kyle just already covered earlier in the presentation. Um, so if you have providers that received under 500000 in provider relief fund payments, um, they just need to break out their expenses for each quarter based on the two categories. So that is general and administrative expenses and healthcare related expenses. So they just need to have a lump number for both of those and also have backup for how they kind of got to each of those figures. If you received 500,000 or more in HHS payments, um, you'll have to go through the more detailed calculation that Kyle went through. So you'll have to break out um, mortgage, lease payments, um, you have to report the additional categories that were broken out by Kyle earlier in the presentation. Um, next slide, please, Lori. So if that wasn't enough in terms of the quarterly reports that we we're going to put together, um, HHS is also going to request non-financial data to be included with each of the quarterly reports that you're putting together. Um, so they're going to ask for first and foremost personnel metrics that they want to know your total personnel by labor category. So they wanna know how many full-time people you have, part-time people, contract, other total rehires and new hires. Uh, keep in mind, they wanna know this by quarter, as I said. So it's not just a lump number for 2019 and 2020. So it could you know, require some additional effort to try to track some of these things down. Uh, and they also are gonna to wanna to know patient metrics, the total number of patient visits you had, whether that's in person or telehealth the total number of patients you admitted, and the total number of resident patients if you're in some sort of facility. Uh, if you're in a facility, uh, they're, wanna gonna, they're gonna wanna know facility metrics as well. So what were your available staff beds for medical and surgical, critical care, and other. Uh, so as you can see, it's gonna, going to cause a lot of somebody's time to put through put these reports together, and it may or may not be worth it to actually go through the calculation. So it is our current recommendation that maybe if you have unexpended funds as of the end of 2020, uh, maybe you don't even wanna go through this lost revenue calculation and you just decide to forego it and kick the remaining money to 2021. And as long as you spend the remaining money by June 30th of 2021 and file another report for that year, uh, then you're good. You don't have to worry about going through the lost revenue calculation at all. So just something to consider uh, going forward. And uh, now that we've kind of went through that, I'm going to kick it back over to Kyle, and he's going to talk about the accounting and tax treatment uh, for these funds. Thanks, Matt. So as we mentioned earlier, the tax treatment for these funds is that they will be taxable in the year that they are received regardless of your reporting to HHS, whether they've been expended. So while you're doing your tax planning in the next few months, that is something to keep in mind. Expenditures will be allowed. So you will be able to take any of the expenditures that you are using these for. For the financial statement users, the HHS money would be re recorded as a deferred revenue until your reporting requirement is met and in that and then in that situation then you move it into revenue so it moves into deferred revenue as you expend your funds or you have your lost revenue calculation as Matt just went over then you bring it into your revenue now there is no true definitive guidance on for profits uh, in this situation it's not a very common thing that for-profit entities are receiving government funding um, like this, but some may follow. There's a 
and international accounting standards. Um, but everything that we have seen is showing that you would start it as deferred revenue, move it into revenue. Any of the not-for-profit entities out there, this falls under the conditional grant definition, um, whereas retention and use of the funds is subject to certain terms and conditions. And the terms and conditions that were issued and attested on when the money was received is the backing behind that. Lori, we can go to the next slide. For any of the for-profit entities that aren't sure or have never needed an audit, uh, there is the possibility of an audit, uh, a financial audit. Um, so my slide is no audits, which is many are at, one audit, two audit, single audit. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a single audit is, uh, it is any time an entity expends $750,000 of more of government funding, they are subject to specific audit requirements that surround the controls, and the expenditures of said monies. Uh, the HHS Provider Relief Fund falls underneath that definition of a government source. So, for-profit entities have the option of a full single audit, which includes all of the controls, all of the financial statement reporting entities, it's a large-scale audit. It is, and if anybody knows any nonprofit or anybody been in public accounting, um, a single audit is its own is its own little uh, monster. It's its own little beast. They also have the option to do what is considered a program audit, which is specifically surrounding that said program and not the rest of the entity. For instance, if you ran a nursing home, it would just be surrounding that particular part of the program. So just what those relief funds were used for, the expenditures and the revenue related to it. A full single audit would include your entire nursing home, which would include, which would encompass significant, significantly more testing, which in turn is generally a significantly larger invoice. Nonprofit entities uh, do not have as much flexibility with this. Uh, they are subject to the uniform guidance. Um, and if anybody needs a little bit more definition on this, feel free to reach out. I don't know we can give you as much guidance on what the difference is between the program audit, a full single audit, or if you're a nonprofit, you know, what uniform guidance is. Now, go to the next slide, Lori. Now, the key words what I said before, an art requirement is for those expending $750,000 during an entity's fiscal year. So, an entity has to expend. That's when the expense occurs in your fiscal year. So, if you have a calendar year, we have a little bit more flexibility. In my following slide, we're going to go into what some of the flexibility and the spending and the planning opportunities surrounding it. Fiscal year ends may not have as much flexibility. If you happen to be a June 30 year end and just a, almost all of your reporting is likely going to be from July 1st until June 30, that's going to be your fiscal year. The reporting requirements for HHS are, as we know, through December and then through June. So both reporting requirements get covered in your fiscal year. There's a little bit less flexibility in that, and we'll go into that. In On September 19th, HHS added a, a paragraph about this, and it stated, and I put it in red, that recipients need to indicate if they're subject to a single audit requirement. And if yes, if they know the auditors, they need to let them know. So HHS is well aware of entities that may or may not need a single audit. When you do your reporting requirement at in the beginning of 2021 through, so this is through calendar year 2020, they are going to know who has expended, who has used $750,000 or more of this HHS provider relief money. 
Lori, we can go to the next slide. And this is where some of the planning comes into it. Now, I mentioned earlier about nursing or healthcare related expenditures. If entities have a little bit more flexibility or have the ability to use these funds up quickly based on rent, based on um, salaries, wages, and it's more or less a, a numbers game, there's a little bit of flexibility here. So, assuming that a provider re received $750,000 or more, so you're in that single audit uh, danger zone, we can call it. Uh, if you have more than one and a half million dollars, your goal is likely to expend or use all of this through 2020, or at least account for it, report on it, um, because in that situation, you, you don't want any more than $750,000 of unused funds. What you're trying to do in this situation is essentially biting the bullet and saying, okay, we are, we are well over the $750,000 mark. We should just try and use this all up in one year, if possible, you know, obviously using the constraints of the terms and conditions, um, to just do a one single audit or a program on it for 2020 and making sure that there's either none or less than 750000 for 2021, avoid uh, the single audit or any type of audit in, in 2021. So that's why this is where I'm leaning towards the one audit versus two. We, we, it would be, you know, it would advise, if possible, to leave more than $750,000 for 2021 and 2020. Um, you've just created two audits for yourself if you have the flexibility to do so. So keep in mind, just be mindful of that. So whether it makes sense to file subsidiary reports to help with this threshold, uh, again, that's something to consider. That's something that we are advising our clients on, taking a look who has received the money, whether it be the general distribution or the targeted distribution. It's something that we're trying to keep cognizant of you know, whether, whether we're reporting on a, the general level or down to the subsidiary level. Now, an entity that has received more than $750,000, but less than that $1.5 million, again, with the flexibility, if you have the flexibility to appropriately expend, you, you want to try and separate these out into two different years. If I've received $1.4 million, if I'm able to expend $700,000 in 2020, and $700,000 in 2021, and I report on each of those, I've essentially received $1.4 million and avoided an audit. Now, that might seem a little bit uh, contradictory, seeing as we are HBK CPAs and we perform single audits, we perform program audits, but we're trying to keep our, our clients' interest in mind. If we can avoid an audit, we can do something to save them money, to keep them in the best financial position. That's what we're here to do. This is why we're advising. This is some of the planning opportunities we'd like to sit down and talk to some of our clients about. Or we can go to the next slide. And this is what we can do now. So obviously we're informing all of our clients, prospects of these upcoming reporting requirements. Um, you can begin accumulating the provider demographic and non-financial information that was covered earlier. The lists and amounts of any of the other assistance received. So you've got PPP loan money, EDIL. You can start to accumulate some of this information. Again, if you're over that $500,000, you can begin segregating and gathering the expenses by subcategory by quarter. It's going to be a cumbersome activity to make sure that you're reporting and comparing apples to apples when you do your final report. So if you can get, start to gather that information for 2019, start to get an idea of what 2020 is looking like, uh, it'll make the exercise of doing the actual report a little bit easier. So that reporting has went from October 1st through February 15th to now just a short 30-day window. So there's going to be a little bit more of a time crunch than initially 
believe. And then revenue related, again, quarter one and quarter two of 2020 um, have been mostly closed out. So maybe be closing out quarter three. You can start to accumulate that information for 19 and the beginning of 2020. The next slide covers is actually straight from the HHS website. It's a summary of what I really just said. Uh, it talks about the different key dates that you need to start considering, some of the reporting data elements that can start to be accumulated at this point. So we wanted to bring that to everybody's attention if you haven't seen this already. And on behalf of HPK, HPK Healthcare Solutions, and our entire team, uh, we wanted to thank everybody who jumped on this call, Lori, Mike, and Matt as well. Now, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. Feel free if you have a, an HPK representative to reach out to them. Um, we're, we're here for you know, the all of our clients. Again, we try and keep their best interest in mind um, when, it, when it comes to all of this. So, Lori, Hi. if there's any questions, mm -hmm. you know, we're here to open the floor. Okay, great. We did get a couple questions in. Uh, the first one is, is the $5 million reporting requirement based on entity TIN or, and or subsidiary TIN? Let me know if you need me to read that again. Yeah, Lori, do you mind just repeating what you said? Yeah, sure. Is the five million dollar reporting requirement based on entity tin and or subsidiary tin? T I N. I think I can take this one. I'll I'll try to take you can you wanna take it, Kyle? Uh, okay. Early on. That's fine. Uh, early on, Mike had covered about if a subsidiary received the targeted distribution, that subsidiary must report the use of the funds. If it was on a, they received the general distribution, which was phase one, this was the one that just kind of showed up, and then the attestation followed. Um, the parent company can report on that directly or can push down to the subsidiary. Yeah, sorry, I was having a Hi. having an issue with my phone. Yeah, it's it's it, it, depending on what type of funds everybody's receiving will kind of determine who does the reporting. Essentially, if it's the targeted distributions, then whoever received the funds has to do it. Um, if it's phase one distribution funds, then it can be reported by the parent; doesn't have to be reported by the subsidiaries. And I read that incorrectly. It's a five hundred thousand dollar reporting requirement. Um, so the next question: If HHS funds are fully expended through eligible expenses by the end of 2020, do we still have to go through the quarterly breakdown for lost revenue calculations? So I kind of I kind of covered that a little bit during my my piece there. It's our current understanding that if you expend all the funds on qualifying expenses through the end of 2020, uh, you do not have to go through that lost revenue calculation, the quarterly breakdown. Um, so that's the goal, what we're trying to to cover. And if we see anything that's covered by HHS and future FAQs or um, webinars, we'll be sure to disseminate that information as we know it. Okay, great. Uh, when you say $750,000 for audit, does that also include PPP payments in that total? It does not. The audit requirement is based on expenditures by 
CFDA number. Uh, the PPP loan is was not a part of that. Unfortunately, the provider relief funds as a whole is, is in the same CFDA number. So in that situation, that anything for the provider relief, but all the other PPP EIDLs, those do not qualify. Okay, for program audit purposes, can we combine 2020 and 2021 expenditures? The audit requirement is based on an entity's fiscal year end. So as, as we demonstrated in the example, that, that was a calendar year end. Um, so there hasn't been an, any guidance from HHS based on saying that you can combine and do what would be considered like a two-year audit for 20 and 2021. Um, based on the reporting requirement and issuing a statement that says you will or need to be, have a single audit or program audit and who the auditor is leads us to believe that it's likely that they're going to want a separate one for 2020 and then if there is a reporting requirement that you also have to do that for 2021 and separate audits but there hasn't been definitive guidance well, based on what there has been that's the that's the undertone that we we've received Do the expenses start January 1, 2020, or when the money was received? Can you repeat that? Sure. Uh, do the expenses start January 1, 2020, or when the money was received? HHS has guidance on on this, and they did say that all the expenditures would would have to be in 2020 uh, because they believe that there wasn't essentially enough time or or the error wasn't as prevalent in the United States uh, during 2019. So they have said that 2020 is going to be the baseline for this. Uh, however. Yes, in short, yes, the answer is 2020 because there hasn't been any guidance that says otherwise. Okay, and along those same lines, are expenses on a cash basis or an accrued basis? million dollar question uh, we believe it's, it's it's when the expenditure or expense occurs um, now this doesn't mean that it, it, it's in your normal course of business uh, what they have said it is they do not ex they do not want people to do a huge prepayment of you know three years worth of insurance premiums um, but if in the normal course of business insurance premiums are paid quarterly. Um, so they haven't actually issued definitive guidance. They've, they've touched on things that you cannot do. Um, but what we believe is it's gonna be closer to a resemblance of a cash basis type accounting method. Okay, and one last question. Will it be automatically sent the form that comes out on January 15th? And if not, where do we get it? I believe all this has to be done through the HHS website. I, I am not sure if they're gonna be sending out forms, but I believe they're opening portals on the website where all the reporting is going to be done. So you just wanna check hhs.gov and navigate to the provider relief fund section and and go through there and you'll find the portal where you can where you can do your reporting 
Okay, great guys, thank you. That's all the questions we have. Thank you everyone for attending and uh, we hope you enjoyed the presentation. Again, okay. yeah, and the video and materials will all be sent to you later. Kyle, did you wanna wrap us up? Sure. Uh, again, I'd just like to reiterate, thank you for everybody in attendance uh, on behalf of HBK and HBK Healthcare Solutions team. You know, we appreciate your attendance, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to myself, Mike, Matt, or any other HBK representative. Thank you. Have a good day.